Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, to the Philosophy of Art and Science. As always, if you support this program, you can join the YouTube channel directly or head over to oxum.substack.com or patreon.com slash oxum. We have a returning special guest today, Charles Haywood. Welcome back to the program. I am super pleased to be here, even more pleased than for most places I am. So, glad <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that because you've been on, uh, I think, a real role lately, especially since the last time I was looking it up. We, I think, last spoke on video May 2021. And since then, you've been on a roll through different um, podcast circuits. I, I think I, I wrote down a couple just so I, I'm sure I missed several, but the ones that stuck out to me were like, the new founding roundtable on Caesarism with um, Michael Anton, Matthew Peterson, Martyr Maid or Daryl Cooper, and David uh, Rabot, Aaron McIntyre, who's now with the Blaze people, so kind of in that similar uh, yep. orbit. And I've kind of talked to some of them before as well. Um, Tucker Carlson before cancellation. And the one I haven't seen, I saw all those. The one I haven't seen, which caught me off guard, was with Hotep Jesus. Yeah, hotel. That was fun. Uh, I really, I really enjoyed that. You know, it's, uh, I, sometimes I get a little bit tired of talking about the, the same old topics. You know, not that it's bad necessarily, but yeah. you know, the same questions. But you know, hotel Jesus was was uh, off the beaten track, and th th those are the fun ones. Right? Yeah, no, th that's actually my favorite thing to do is to bring somebody who's like known for one thing, and then to totally throw people off. I had. Uh, Canadian uh, journalist Jeff Pierce, who who has had quite a, a really good and one of the only independent journalists, I would say, who's had a really good track record on Ethiopia the past two to three years. And so people are and you you come to my channel expecting talk of Ethiopia. The whole first hour, hour and 15 minutes, we just talked about Shotokan Karate. <laughs> 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 no, I just talk about. I mean, that's that's what keeps it keeps it interesting. No one wants to hear the same stuff over and over. And if you're interested in a particular person's output, you, you need some variety. I mean, when I talked to to Carlson, I think half the time we talked about like beekeeping and hobby farming, you know, <laughs> rather than yeah, you know, the, the electoral justice protest or some of the more political, yeah political topics, the spicier topics. Yeah, I I um um I do I I do want to come back to those at at the end but for our orthodox christian audience I thought it would be great uh you shared it recently although it's a it's an older article your review of on wealth and poverty by St John um Chrysostom I I would love to hear your thoughts on Chrysostom in general and or or that school because you also mentioned the the Antiochian or the Antiochian school of biblical exegesis yeah. which I always give shine on in uh, my channel <laughs> Well, it's so uh, uh, there's a series of books uh, called Popular Patristics by St. Vladimir's Press. Uh, I, I assume I haven't really looked into. It. I assume from the name there, there some kind of. Uh, I'm not actually sure what what kind of sub branch of orthodoxy is theirs, but they have a book, a series of short, readable paperbacks of church fathers, in essence, maybe like 120, 20 books, including a, a whole bunch of very interesting stuff. I've only read a few. It's something I, I aspire to do. And I've read, I did read, and I'll come back to it in a second, St. John Chrysostom's On Wealth and Poverty, which is, like a lot of these books, a, a series of or a couple of different sermons that he gave. I actually just started reading this week a kind of uh, parallel book, St. Basil's book on social justice and by social justice yes. he does not mean what we mean by social justice nowadays <laughs> you know left-wing agit prop <laughs> but rather it's much it covers many of the same topics and, and there really is a compare and contrast thing going on because for example saint basil's approach to christ's parable of the rich young man is a different approach than saint john chrysostom or saint clement of alexandria had in terms of how one should apply as a, as a christian layman the that parable to one's one's own life so it, it's a very interesting set of things but i highly recommend these things what i find chrysostom apparently has many many sermons recorded because they had people transcribing his sermons and i i find these to be the very edifying obviously but they're also enjoyable because they're transcribed even with his asides like pay attention to me <laughs> and you just I love that. him in this in this in, you know in this, in this big church and he's a popular guy but a bunch of the people there are probably just there because he's a rock star and they're really thinking about the week's activities and and, and cutting business deals and in, in the uh in the side colonnades and 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 so on and um the, the funniest part of one of his sermons totally aside from, from the topics is where he opens up a sermon it was right after, I think, the Saturnalia, the pagan festival. 
and he by congratulating his parishioners on not drinking excessively and not dancing lasciviously but he does it in a way that make, it sounds sarcastic like like, like i know yeah. you did these things <laughs> so you know it, it, he, he lays it on a bit thick i think as, as an admonition to some of his parishioners and it's just it's just interesting because it gives you a sense of the man in a way that you, i think you don't get even in a lot of of modern writings if you just read a book that some guy put together in his study as opposed to saint john's on the spot semi ad hoc sermons to a group of real people all of whose traits are recognizable in us today it just it, it teaches you there it's not that different nothing really changes and this is obvious if you read the bible even in the old testament your people's motivations and behaviors and to a certain extent beliefs are, are are the same now and then but i think the modern tendency is very frequently to treat people in the past as ignorant and stupid when the, the, the very opposite is is the case we're stupider than they were both on a a uh, religious basis largely but also in a purely secular basis that is people back then had to be smarter and you know more better on their feet because there was less of a safety net and you, know, you just had to be a, a smart human being to to you know, do okay in life and so people i think underrate uh people in the past anyway that's a lot, long long kind of rambling introduction to i i i very much recommend chrysostom's on on wealth and poverty and happy to speak about the specifics as well yes no that was a, a great introduction and the way you said he's kind of speaking off the cuff you have these stenographers writing these things live as if it's in a, a court <laughs> case uh with sbf or something <laughs> and um yeah there's actually um and the series is from uh, Saint Vladimir, so it is from the uh, the Russian Orthodox Church in the diaspora, um, founded, of course, by the great um, monarchists who are part of the. Uh, what what are they? Are they called the? Is it the White Party? What was the the pro monarchist well, side? The, the Whites was the the monarchist side in the Russian Civil War, and obviously you know, they, yeah. they were forced to leave. A lot, yeah. A lot of people don't know that they were emigres from that side that like even if they weren't politically active that went to france and then from france they kind of made it over to new york where they established that uh great school but they also do have kind of an armenian connection because there's an armenian uh school there nurses and they have a lot of back and forth i actually took an old testament course this summer uh online with saint vladimir's and the 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 kind of secretary or person handling the zoom was armenian and it, it was very funny the way they interact and then they've released several books uh from like a sub coptic print so they they have collaborations i imagine that there's some financial incentive more than a great uh uh the th great threat of ecumenism that a lot of ortho bros online are terrified of us monophysites or well, I, I, I was just doing that yesterday that there was some dispute about uh, uh, the patriarch of antioch reaching out to the to the cops uh, i i have i'm all for i favor the cops i actually there's a coptic church that i can see from my house wow i mean they were literally like a third of a mile away uh relatively recent built here in here in Indiana, and so and my church is actually Greek Orthodox Church is is relatively close too. So it, there's a, you know, some degree. I mean, we're friendly to each other, for example. I mean, I, I was, we're not in communion, obviously, but I mean, there is the the Christological controversies that that revolve around those things uh, fade into fade into the background with some of the other challenges that we're we're facing. <laughs> so, yes, ab <laughs> absolutely. Like if you're <clears throat> If you're uh, triaging, it's very low on the priority list. And um, going back to the, like Chrysostom, I think his whole style, it, it can be described as food for the soul, this kind of practical life advice. Uh, in He's a homilist, he's not a theologian. And that's why people who view themselves as intellectuals, funny enough, don't usually choose him as their favorite, but that's why he's one of my favorites is because He's got that practical wisdom that you said that the ancients have. What I think a lot of people focus on the kind of metaphysics that secular folks don't agree on. And it's like, I'm uninterested in that. I'm more interested in trying to convince them of how accurately a scripture predicts human behavior, even yeah. though this, uh, these texts are so old. I, I'll tell you one of the things I was most impressed with is this idea that you talk about how you're unabashedly uh, an affluent man and we talked about that a lot so people could go back to the our first conversation to learn more about the the shampoo magnate that you are <laughs> but um or or as elon musk likes to say magnet <laughs> yes. um but like 
talk about how you grappled with that and the tech. I think you did that really well. And the kind of um, the you were un, you you were scathing in your own critique of yourself as you were reading Chrysostom's text. Well, and, and I, I'm I'm having to do it again reading Saint Basil. So you know, yeah. every, everything old is new again. So, I mean, Chrysostom spends is himself very scathing about rich people, not so much as rich people, but in essence that his essential claim is that, and St. Basil's too, I think there's differences of emphasis and I'll have to kind of compare and contrast. His essential claim is that if you have an excessive amount of stuff, consumption stuff in essence, uh, whether that's clothes or houses or what have you, you're stealing that from the poor. And he, he puts it basically that bluntly, and he he stays away uh, to a certain degree from the Saint Clement position that well it's a council of perfection to sell everything you have and give it to the poor and really the focus should be on freeing your mind from the problems that and your soul from the problems that avarice brings. Saint John is much more kind of materially oriented, practically oriented. Like yeah, sure, you obviously you you want to focus on Christ, not on you know, the big pile of gold you have in your bedroom. That <laughs> goes without saying, right? Here you can only it's a form of idolatry. This is kind of a trivial theological point, but his point is much more practical. That your your duty is to distribute what you have to the poor, and the more the better. With basically no limit. And that doesn't mean you're necessarily going to be ranked with the goats if you sell down to one threadbare tunic, but it, it's not saying you're not going to be with the goats either. <laughs> I mean, he's not, he doesn't pull any punches, right? <laughs> so uh, so yeah, for a, per a person who has money, and certainly I have money, but he, he, let's be honest, he, there is obviously poverty in the United States, but by yeah. historical standards, the majority of people in America are rich uh, in terms of the, 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 the things they have, the, the, the uh, safety nets they have, as well as governmental safety nets and so on. So this applies to everybody. Not, the, the natural tendency is for people to say, everybody likes to define, and I think studies have proven this, that rich is someone who makes a little bit more than me. But yes. I think John would disagree with that. He'd say, like, if you have a nice house and you can take nice vacations, you're rich. Uh, even if it's you know, one vacation a year and that you need to heed my words. And then he'd yell at you and say, pay attention to me. <laughs> so, so I think it's very, it, it, it's a, it's a very practically based, but very hard set of set of admonishments. Absolutely. I, I remember the time when Sanders was more in the news and we'll talk about this rift later uh, on the left because it's uh, funny and interesting and it can relate to what's on the right but I remember when he was in the news more frequently people were providing this critique of him saying look the people in America are in the one percent of the world so if you take your arguments to their logical conclusion uh, you're going to be depleting a lot of the wealth of the United States for 99% of the world. And and you know he's not going to do that. And that was where some of the kind of funny overlap existed between the kind of Buchananite and uh, Trump wing of the right and then the the Bernie bros, uh, as they were called yeah. on the left. Is They kind of agreed in a... in a He didn't use the the term America first, but he, he kind of believed in it. Yeah, I, 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 I think that's true. And I think... There's a whole bunch of interesting threads, I and mean, we could probably spend hours just talking about about some of these topics. But the there's a whole bunch of interesting threads. For example, you know, the Saint Basil talks about how people in his Christian society. I mean, he lived in the Christian society. He goes on a fairly lengthy rant about how people, meaning the people who he's talking to, some of them face the choice of which child shall I sell into slavery so that I can the rest of them can eat. You know these things that are inconceivable yeah. to us. You know you think of the slavery and those kind of things as a pagan thing. But that's not what was going on, right? I mean, there is, and so we don't have that. And so we say, well, you know, it, it, it's not as bad. The poor have the poor have iPhones. So really, why do they need my help? Why can't I have my two iPhones? <laughs> the poor people, well, uh, we, we, for example, our church have started a new food pantry because there's a lot, even though we're in a relatively wealthy area, it, you know, there's a surprising amount of people who simply don't have any food. But a lot of them come in with iPhones or cars. And Chrysostom talks about this too, that you know, your, your job isn't to spend your time except in extreme cases, obviously, where someone comes in, you know, asking for money for drugs or something, that you're not to say, 
you know, I, I, I rate this person as worthy and that person as not worthy. Your job is to give freely rather than to spend all your time putting conditions on things. And I think when you put it through a political frame, it tends to that that kind of admonishment tends to get lost. Absolutely. I have a, a really good friend and then my own mother who have kind of shamed me in this view, not not with their words, but with their with their actions. My, I have a good friend who he takes some of the, the words very literally. So he'll try to like not let his one hand see what the other hand does as he gives to the port, like very literally tries to do that. And he he'll just give whatever is in his wallet, whatever is there at the time. And then he'll turn around again to taking it very literally and apologize to me for having given to the poor in front of my eyes, as opposed to having done it in secret when where only the heavenly father could see my mom more directly on this point that you say, and she's not a church goer and has never been a church goer in her life, but has always identified as an Orthodox Christian. She's cradle like me, obviously. Um, I remember one time there was a swindler and I knew this person was swindling and they were asking for $20 for like some fake project. And my mom didn't vet them at all, gave them the money. And when they left, I, I was like a teenager or something. I kind of confronted her about it. I was like, you know, that person was a swindler. And mm -hmm. she's like, I do actually know that. She, like, she wasn't convinced by them at all, but she said, if they're asking for $20, they need it more than me. And I was like, wow, like <laughs> that yeah, true. <laughs> would get behind that, I think. I mean, yeah. And, and and that last point you were mentioning, the political point is the last thing I want to mention about this is that um, and, and you kind of brought it up by speaking of your church, your, your local parish as an institution that that gives back is there's this um, this delusion, especially with some of that strong language about like theft, you know, that you see particularly communists who are also Christian. It's very difficult. I don't know how they square that circle, but there are some people who try to square the circle of communism with Christianity, although they may call it different things. You know, we know what it is. And um, that line is like a famous line of Kropotkin, the famous like Russian communist, uh, that property itself, like private ownership, the means of uh, private production itself is is theft in a way. And, and that's not what Chrysostom is, is saying, right? Can you talk about this uh, difference between the duty of the state versus the duty of the individual and the church? It, it's interesting because nowhere in Chrysostom, or my bet is not being an exponent, but I think this is probably a safe bet. Nowhere in any of the church fathers is there the slightest hint uh, that there's a governmental obligation to help the poor. He, he's talking strictly to to individuals. And so he's not saying that, ta that your taxes need to be used in order to help the poor. He's saying you need to personally help the poor. And I think that the, uh, the uh, I think I, I quoted in my Chrysostom review, the late Joseph Sobran had a joke where he said that uh, that some people conflate the commandment, love your neighbor as yourself and the commandment give everything you have to the poor into a new commandment, give everything your neighbor has to the poor. And so, <laughs> sure, I mean, they, they, this is a very kind of personal uh, obligation. Um, and so I've, I've, I've lost the thread of the question. I apologize. The thread of the question is, is the government obligated to give to the poor or you and your community? Right. I mean, I think, I think that the in the modern world, I think that there is a, there's an argument to be made that the government probably should be giving some uh, money to the poor. But the problem is that the that erodes the uh, erodes two things. It obviously erodes the people's individual feeling of obligation. They're like, well, the government will take care of it. And I pay my taxes and I pay too many taxes. So really, you know, the poor are getting too much. So I have no personal obligation. But the bigger problem and the more hidden problem, which people have been pointing out for nigh on 100 years, but is that when the government starts doing these things, it destroys the intermediary institutions that are designed to provide for the less fortunate members of society. So not only takes over the personal obligation, but it eliminates the intermediary institutions, whether that's the role of churches or the Salvation Army. I mean, these things still exist, but they're not as crucial as they used to be. And it's also true that the government is unable to make the fine distinctions that are important as well as the admonishments that are also important. So for example, if you're in a community and you're giving to people, you want to give freely. You want to give the $20 because those people need it more. But at the same time, that doesn't mean you shouldn't say, you know, hey, 
you, how about you not spend that on that alcohol? You know, here's a, here's another alternative. Or maybe I'll go with you and buy some food. When the government gets involved, those kind of personal interactions that characterize local intermediary institutions disappear. And so everybody becomes dependent upon the state or they abdicate their responsibilities to the state. And what you're left with is a mass of atomized citizens and the almighty things. And then, of course, if the state gets captured uh, in some way and decides to, to tie benefits to some unhealthy or immoral requirements, then you have a whole other set of problems. Uh, we're on YouTube, so I can't be too specific. So <laughs> it, 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 it's, um, uh, I think on balance, it would be better if the government largely stayed out of, of charity. Uh, problem is you can't go back. You can't just announce one day the government's today going to stop it's it's giving because the old structures that allowed alternative methods for money to be funneled to needy community members are all gone. So you just have catastrophe. So I, mean, I don't know what the solution is there, but it's it's not a great position to be in for society. It's not. And and I appreciate your awareness. A lot of guests see this is how I know you've made the podcast rounds is because you you know, and I know you had that previous experience we talked about on Amazon, but the the algorithms, uh, I, I don't know, maybe they know a phrase like let's go, Brandon, but certainly <laughs> electoral justice will evade them. And uh, it really just kind of invites creativity and neologisms. So uh, I appreciate you working with me uh, in that regard. And I think we've fed our Orthodox Christian audience enough. There may be some overlap with that. And I, the... I have a question for you, though. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, you know, you're a deacon, obviously, but you posted yeah. something on, on Twitter maybe a couple of weeks ago. I think it was in response to one of these format questions, like where I am, what I could see myself being. And yeah, you know, that, but you implied that you might consider the priesthood at, at, at some point. If I if I read that correctly, <laughs> is that something you're you're actually considering or attempting to see if there's a discernment there? Or, I uh, yeah, you know, I've had so many situations uh, this Orthodox Christmas, uh, which uh, happens to match the dates of the electoral justice protests. <laughs> I I spent in Dallas, Texas, and I was. Um, teaching uh, the St. Michael's Parish in the Ethiopian church there, but it was a very interesting uh, combo of people. Uh, the, the priest there is very creative, Father Andualam, I'll give him credit for this, because he he got uh, a white American PE teacher to to run the children through like actual like PE activities in the morning, <laughs> hire them out, so that uh, in the afternoon, the older kids and then some of the younger kids uh, would be split into different groups. And there was um, an Indian Orthodox, The um, I, I, they have slight divisions, but either Malankara or the Jacobite, uh, but they're in communion with us. Okay. The, the Indian Orthodox priest was there. I believe his name was Father Matthew. And he was teaching the younger kids. I was teaching the older kids. And kind of in between sessions, um, he was asking me about my career, my kind of secular career and things that I've done, right? Because it's it's different back home, you know, I would have specialized in something in the church and maybe made an income off the church like that. But here I've had to pay the bills other ways. So right. I've been a mediator, I've been an organization in courts, I've been an organizational ombudsman in universities, and I've been a school teacher. And he's like, you know what combines all of those <laughs> professions? And he, he didn't say it explicitly, but I knew he was inferring the priesthood. And that wasn't even me saying that. Um, at the same time, I've had my own archbishop, which is definitely a weightier matter, uh, insinuated and uh, say it almost every time he blesses me. So it's, it's something that I've seriously considered um, turning 33 next week. And I don't, I don't want to even really consider it until 40. Um, but sometimes circumstances um, force you. I, I, I recall, this is great because it's a segue with, with John Chrysostom. Mm -hmm. He had to be physically dragged into the bishopry. He, yes. he was happy as just a monk uh, who occasionally would enter the city to preach. But he was literally and physically dragged. And one of my favorite texts from him is on the priesthood which is a kind of like dissuading people from it. And so I believe in this archetype. You see it also in J.R. Tolkien's um, The Lord of the Rings series with Aragorn, that he's he's the prototypical or the quintessential reluctant king. Um, it's the idea that 
the type of leadership you are is not necessarily type A personality. Uh, you may be more that, which is why you're, you're so, so more successful than me in that regard. But and I've seen I've had a lot of friends in that. But I'm the type of leader. I am a leader. I'm typically the leader that sees the torch on the ground that's neglected and picks it up. Uh -huh. And so if certain circumstances were pushed and the right things happened, I did kind of say that a little more tongue in cheek on Twitter. Um, but it is something I've seriously considered, and it is something that several mentors in my life have, have yeah. pushed me to. But it, it comes with certain uh, consequences. I'd, I'd probably have to be more silent like the Desert Fathers on certain, yeah, I mean, <laughs> on yeah, certain things. Yeah, a lot of consequences. But, I mean, you, you, you're married now, obviously, and you, ha you have, a, have a kid. So you, you, yeah. you know, I think sometimes people who want to get married are considering the priesthood. They're like, well, I'm, I can't. You know, I, I want to be married first because I mean, I, I assume in the Ethiopian Orthodox, it's like in the, the Greek Orthodox where you can be married, but you can't get married after you're ordained. Uh, correct. And I'm already married and have a right. kid. So you're set, you're set there. So, yeah. You know, yeah. You if it was just about logical possibility, I, I could, you know, later today I could schedule an appointment and become a priest. But it's, you know, <laughs> there are more and my bishop would be willing, but they're just more uh, considerations. I also joke with some people, it's a little tongue in cheek, but maybe something behind there. Um, and, and and this is also a good segue for your your piece, uh, A Gallop in Ethiopia. I, I think it's pronounced right, Eve Marie Stranger's uh, uh, book. But there's this idea in Ethiopian history, particularly from about um, the year 1000 to 1270, Ethiopia was ruled by several priest kings, from which the the mythos of Prester uh, Prester John, I almost said Prester Enoch, Prester John arose, uh, and and so that's the idea of the priest kings of Ethiopia, which we have several, and it's funny because they were canonized and made priest kings, but it was the people who changed their regime, which was my direct family, uh, mm -hmm. that that changed that, and so on my. On my father's side, you have many clergy, and on my mother's side, you have many aristocratic rulers, and so the the kind of logical combination of that. The <laughs> funny. Of here is to bring back. <laughs> so I, I, I think we should make this the, the new, new fashion, or at least meme fashion. Bring back priest kings. This yeah, Christian priest kings. Uh, That's we don't, right. I, There's an know. interesting Serbian tradition I had seen by vis visiting a couple uh, Russian monasteries of certain princes who after uh relinquishing uh, before death relinquishing their power they would go to the monasteries after that's also a very uh common tradition i have a great grandmother who did that and i know many other people who have like grandparents who either they're uh you know they're widowed or for uh for some other reason they at the end of their life they do it my last ancestor on the throne emperor susnios in the 1600s he he did this he converted to catholicism and there was a battle that ensued where thousands of people died. And so they say he repented, relinquished power to his son, and then uh, spent the rest of his days in a monastery, which is a very honorable way uh, to do. Probably a sound choice on his part. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so some, some people doubt the veracity of whether he repented. Maybe they said he kind of stayed Catholic, but then didn't promulgate it anymore. But um it but, did go to the monastery, which is you know, yeah. a good place to, to spend out your days. Yes, and instead of leading to you know the death of thousands of of your own people, I, I know you had assessed that book, and it was the second one after the throne of Adulis uh, in this kind of category. I'm wondering if you remember anything from from that great article, uh, Strangers Book. Yes, uh, I, I love Strangers Book. It was interesting because you know I, I don't. It, it's funny. Uh, I read the book because Stranger, uh, it, who's French, was. Um, he followed my my blog for years. Like he commented occasionally and so on. And then he wrote this book. I'm like, that book sounds awesome. So I so I, I read the book. And the, the book is a is this kind of a slim volume, kind of semi autobiographical. It's not doesn't purport to be like a, a voluminous history of Ethiopia. It's kind of snapshots of, of modern, mostly Ethiopian life. And I think he married an Ethiopian woman, but he doesn't That's give good. a lot of he doesn't give a lot of details. He does he talks about his mother in law. More than he talks about his his wife, and I think that they all moved ultimately back to. But again, I'm I'm not totally sure about that. It's a it's a bit uh, opaque. But the book to someone who doesn't know anything about Ethiopia, uh, I know as I, I think I said in this review, I know a bit more than the average American about Ethiopia, which just means I know more than zero. I mean, the, the average American has no idea about anything about Ethiopia. Uh, you know, confuses it with Kenya, <laughs> you know, doesn't have any idea of Ethiopian history, much less you know, modern Ethiopian history, much less you know, 3,000 years ago or 2,000 years ago or 1,000 years ago. So it's it's interesting because he gives a real sense to the reader of uh, 
basic facts about Ethiopian history, what the society is like now, and how it's changed even over the time that he's been there. Because I mean, if people don't understand that Ethiopia is you know, a big country with a big population that has a lot of potential, which tends to get wasted because of internal divisions. I mean, that's how I kind of summarize it for for an American audience. And I, I say in my my discussion of the book that occasionally, you know, I, in the back of my head, I wonder if Ethiopia will rise again as a world power. And you, know, you can imagine that happening. But I, I conclude again from my kind of. American perspective that it's not likely because the Ethiopians spend too time spend too much time sniping at each other with internal divisions which are opaque to an American right they're very important to an Ethiopian but they're completely opaque uh, to an American which is too bad because Ethiopia as one of the largest Christian countries and probably as a like if you if you did like a weighted average of religious belief uh, times the you know, this, this devoutness of religious belief times average times the number of population i'm sure that the kind of christian weight of the opio vastly outweighs that of europe for example in terms of like the number of people who are actually fervent believers in, in jesus christ the, the e ethiopia probably has a lot of heft to it it just you know needs to get on the horn and do something in the world stage <laughs> Yeah, I, I remember I was researching for a piece I was writing once. I forget the exact number now, but they had even more monks than in Russia. It was something crazy, like twenty to 40,000 monks active or yeah. something ridiculous like that. And something like 98% of the population <laughs> of affirms either Christianity or Islam. It's interesting that actually in the 70s, there's this whole um, region called the, o the Ogaden, which borders Djibouti and Somalia. That is basically they're just Somalis that are within the Ethiopian nation state, and that's an issue of within the scramble of Africa, settling kind of relatively arbitrary borders, but to secure sure. the the empire. And and some of them are proud Ethiopians, but there's a contingent of them that kind of want to secede. And this will be a great segue for our next topic of Spain. But Emperor Haile Selassie, before he was deposed by the uh, global communist movement or the uh, international community. Um, he was in some talks with Richard Nixon and with even the Somalis. And this was right before, I think it was during the communist period that the uh, Soviet, uh, or maybe it was right before, I forget the exact dates, but I know it was in the 70s. There was a war between Ethiopia and Somalis. And the Somalis were so Sovietized, uh, but then later the Ethiopians become Sovietized too. Um, he almost offered them the Ogaden back. And if you did that, interestingly, like right now, people argue about if the numbers of Islam is something between 33 to 40 percent, some even crazy think it's 50. It's it's nowhere near that. If you got rid of that, that Ogaden region, which is 100 percent Islam, the, the natural Ethiopian highlands, even if there are a couple of different ethnicities there that are uh, at war with each other from time to time, they're all Orthodox Christian. And uh, the majority of the country is overwhelmingly, and and the numbers would shift to something like eighty to ninety percent yeah. at yeah. that point. That that sounds like a sound strategic move. I mean, countries don't like to give up their territory, but I mean, it, it's the. I mean, it, what is the population of Ethiopia now? Hundred and ten million? million. Yeah, hundred ten yeah. million. Yeah, I mean, and and the, and that region is maybe six to, six to ten million at most. Yeah. So, I mean, again, I'm, I'm not an Ethiopian geostrategic player, but it, it certainly, certainly sounds like it would, it would make a lot of sense. I mean, the, the Ethiopian, do you know what the projections are on the Ethiopian population? Uh, I don't know exactly, but I, I've seen something maybe 200 million by 2050 or something. It, it's grown a lot when, yeah. um, when my parents, just to use the capital city, Addis Ababa as an example, when my parents lived there from the 50s to the 70s, the population was something like 300 to 400,000, and now it's um, 3 million. Yeah. I mean, and Stranger talks about that in his book. I think he ran some kind of uh, business renting out horses for tours in the highlands, and how basically the, all the areas that they used to wander around on horses are now buildings. That you know the city has just expanded so so much that it's uh, it's taken over a lot of land that was used to be far away from the city, which is the the way these things work. I mean, uh, absolutely, and and I can't blame you for your pessimistic take, as you said, it just you know lack of knowledge. It's not ill will or anything like that, and. There are even like rooters and press, let alone, you know, CNN and other organizations that you'd kind of expect a little more from. They're extremely biased and had ties to this originally Marxist organization. But you, you, you know the switch where it goes from um, 
uh, class communism to race communism, mm -hmm. and and then they, they define it very narrowly what even race is because really it's one race in in Ethiopia, but it's like, you know, the the it's a linguistic race the category that they create, and so it's like a a pseudo linguistic racial category and communism based off of that that kind of. Uh, took over for the past 30 years and then 20 years for the 20 years before that it was communism and so you had 50 years of the beloved international community interfering with the historic rulers of Ethiopia so while it looks like there's a sort of parity between them in my opinion and you know I'm biased you can say but the historical rulers and the strongest real military force are the Amhara tribe and the Amhara uh, tribe have these militiamen called Fanno and they have this uh tripartite like title that they call themselves in Amharic they say Arash Kadash Takwash which means they're self-subsistence farmers and it's because they would look down on kind of other trades they'd rather uh, uh you know be able to support themselves than have any sort of middleman or boss and then um they they go to church Kadash means they they attend mass or they, they are themselves clergy and lead the mass and then the final thing is that when the time is right they're shooters they're people who who are always armed to whether the the law is supported or not and this is right now just for the record to say that again it's very based yeah <laughs> <laughs> i didn't understand it as a kid but when i was into like independent hip-hop my mom used to listen to country music and i'm like why why do you like this stuff and she would say because she's a nationalist and it reminds her of ethiopian nationalism i never understood it as a kid but i understood it the older i get and i still don't listen to that much country but i i relate to it more now than i did as a kid but my question is can, can the Ethiopian people withstand the inevitable onslaught of global homo, right? You know, the, the, that, that's, that's the great, that's, yeah. We're kind of farther down the arc, right? We're, we're, we're well into this and we're either going to come out of this or we're not. Either way, it's yes. dramatic. But the Ethiopians are on the upswing, but the, there's a, no doubt enormous forces trying to turn them into you know, ruin their culture, eliminate all those three things you just talked about and do do the usual kind of tap dance on the grave of the Ethiopian people, like you know, like the Ukrainians say. I exactly. Mean, uh, uh, it, it, do you think the Ethiopians will be resistant to that? We're very resistant. The city's less so than the rural, but the rural is 80 to 90 percent of the population. And um, what what's interesting is that we got a gasp of breath during Donald Trump's uh, reign but during biden's reign is when it's been going down and blinken had been super active like super active and hands-on in ethiopia's traveled there uh, two to three times if i'm not mistaken in the past couple of years but then he got occupied with ukraine and russia and now he's getting occupied with israel and palestine and for me it's like anyone who's played uh, strategy games like board games like risk as i did as a child is like uh, or even monopoly which most people have played is at a certain point you're over global homo is not omnipotent and omniscient it's it's gonna have some limits to it and it's gonna be overextended and going back to the triaging we're talking about earlier ethiopia should be a lower priority than israel palestine and ukraine russia uh, and by the way guess who's been visiting ethiopia a lot recently are the 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 russian orthodox holy synod has sent representatives in fact we celebrated um the exaltation of the the cross recently together and that you saw a bunch of russian orthodox clergy with ethiopian uh instruments like the staff and the sistrum and then you saw and they gave an opportunity for the russians to in uh, uh church old church slavonic to praise at at this so it was kind of a a con celebration without the eucharist and it, it was really but then the russian uh, political officials have also been coming to russia and there's this history not only during the soviet period but during the czarist pe period and i post pictures occasionally from uh czarist russia but there were a few ethiopian aristocrats educated in russia and then there were a lot of uh, visits back and forth and uh, there's even this great uh, couple of books from uh, alexander bolotovich who was ethnically ukrainian but he was a russian yeah. and he he came uh, he lived a, a crazy life. He was like in, the, I think, the Sino-Russian wars. And then he came right after Italy invaded the first time to Ethiopia to help the Ethiopians a after the fact, like with the Red Cross and stuff. 
and then he like retired at Mount Athos and got got into this weird uh, heresy about the, the the holy name. I think was in the <laughs> Our Father. Very interesting guy. People should uh, try to avoid going off the rails and heresy at the end of their lives. That should be <laughs> yeah. their new ideas on something you should be adopting when you're like seventy. But whatever. Yeah, like yeah. Ch but Chesterton, and Spence, and and all that. Like that's the way of Tertullian. Uh, I love Tertullian because he was an early witness of Enoch, but he went he went off the rails right towards the, the rails. end of his life. But it's interesting that the Russians are reaching out, and I think the Chinese are also reaching yes. out. Because, you, know, the, you, you see this, and this is kind of trivially obvious, right? We show up and we want to push you know, uh, these left-wing, anti-Christian, global homo things on people, maybe give them a few bucks. And by people, I mean other countries. Whereas other countries show up and they're like, well, we're not going to interfere with your, your religion or your culture, and we're going to help invest in expanding your infrastructure. I mean, only a fool would take the first deal because America doesn't bad that, that america has ruined ruined everything by not having anything to offer but you, you, you even like the military power of america is increasingly being at least potentially exposed as as overstated and that, that's not a great position to be in because you you have nothing to offer and you can't threaten people so, so here your influence is going to decline it's just the yeah way e ethiopia is very small right now it's interesting the saudis and the uh, uae have have been involved too just this morning um, there's some arguments about the ports right now. The current prime minister who has a different strategy of without getting bogged down too much into it, his Oromo tribe, he wants to have a, a re-image of a, of a new pagan or a kind of pagan Ethiopia. Um, but it's weird because he's also an evangelical Christian. Okay. There's a lot of confusion there. But anyway, Sorry. he's been threatening to take the ports of Eritrea or Djibouti or even Somalia or one of the Somalias, because there are many Somalias. And um, he's doing it as a distraction because the, the militia men that I mentioned from my tribe, the Amhara, have been um, amassing a force that are going to overthrow him. And so if he's smart, he'll escape the country like the communist uh, dictator Mangustu did. But yes. uh, in the meantime, in Saudi Arabia and Jeddah this morning, the Eritrean president, Isaiah Safwerki, and the Ethiopian prime minister, they got gold medals and, and signed a peace deal because there was a lot of militaristic language. And I think he was just doing it to distract from the militia men that are on their way to the capital city uh, fairly soon. But I think if if you tell me long picture global to for global relevance, for people less interested in the Horn of Africa, I think it might be one of the breaking points of... Uh, of the um that that helps the multipolar world emerge yeah. so it might just be one of the the larger cracks or that one of the straws sense. on the camel's back the strategic location the you know the people the resources well not i mean not so much the resources ethiopia doesn't have any oil last i checked uh but uh but you know it, it really is i mean totally aside from the specifics of it, it really this is not this is different than the future I was promised, but I guess that's, it always is. I mean, you know, yeah, it, it's uh, mostly like red. It's like strategic. The strategic thing is like just closer launch points to Russia and China and the Middle East. And then the economic point, the main piece is actually the, the commerce, the ship commerce that still happens in the red sea. It's, it's quite a narrow passage. And, uh, that, that that's a very important and, and Eritrea is already not a friend of the international community where Ethiopia to flip there. Uh, they would be in trouble commerce wise in that in that area. Yeah. Um, but but all of this is that, you know, global homos desire in Ethiopia's balkanization. And we see now it's crazy. Awesome. I've been studying the regions of Spain. They're trying to balkanize Spain. Spain's on the map again. And you have this great article, which I think people should go read on the great Generalismo Francisco Franco, who was a friend of Emperor Haile Selassie. I shared some pictures with you. And then even there was another aristocrat who was a cousin of uh, Haile Selassie. And I had uh, uh, their daughter and their granddaughter on my program to talk about awesome. how communism impacted them. It's, yeah, I mean, I'm a big Franco fan. I have a piece which gets a lot of traction on the internet, which is a very long piece or fairly long piece that, that summarizes all the things that you didn't know, not you personally, but people don't know about Franco because people, you know, yeah, I, even I was like, I was talking to my priest the other day and you know, he referred to Franco as like a fascist. And I'm like, yeah. yeah. Now, Father, let let me let me share a few things with you. I was you know, adequately respectful, obviously, but I'm like that's that, that's somewhat somewhat underinformed. And so I think that it, it's interesting because people always say, well, Franco, you know, you know, whether he was good or bad, he, he, whatever he tried to do did not last. 
and uh, I, and same thing. He he died roughly at the same time that Haile Selassie was was overthrown. And it, it, but it, what people don't seem to appreciate is that that was in many ways the high water mark of global homo in terms of its ability to influence international affairs. And uh, it seems like the high water mark is now. But I think that back then it, it, we didn't recognize what was happening. There's, I, I I actually didn't know this, but apparently. Uh, the guy who was pegged to succeed Franco was killed in a car bombing a couple of years before Franco's death in Madrid, and the CIA is suspected in of, of involvement in the car bombing. I actually ha had not heard that. I, I, had I heard that recently because it was a comparison to the guy who was just offed from the 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 right party right now in Spain. Yeah, so that's why I saw I saw it as well. So it's the you know, the my thesis, and this kind of relates a little bit to what we're talking about Ethiopia, is that. The yes, it's true that everything Franco did disappeared uh, shortly after his death, but that was a different time. I mean, that was what 50, 50 years ago, That's roughly. Right. And so you know, the worm is turning, or at least the worm is potentially turning. So you can imagine if a new Franco came to power in a place that needed the kind of reforms that Franco brought, that that person could change the mind of the people and not have the outside influence regime change and, and this fundamentally becomes a question of is the current system by system i mean the regime or the western way of global homo is that a doomed system and if so what will replace it i think in the arc of the cycle of regimes we're at a different place now so i think with the right changes if they can be accomplished by the right people they're likely to be a lot more lasting i mean there's counter arguments to that for example you have to have some children in order for that to be possible. And none of the Europeans are having any children. And so inherently you don't have a future if you don't have any children. So that, that's one one of many possible counter arguments. Nonetheless, I think looking at the life of Franco is very instructive and one shouldn't just say, well, you know, he worked hard, he did these good things, but it, it all ended when he died. One should rather see, well, what can we learn from that to, to apply to the future? Yeah, I, I, I think you, you mentioned it briefly, but I would love if you expand on this idea of fascism because it's used so loosely and intentionally so to give justification to be able to punch people at protests, right? <laughs> but um, I think these things have technical meanings and even some of the professors really mess this up because of their, of their biases. Anyone right of center is a fascist. But could you talk about, for example, the 20th century regimes just in, in four places, right? In Spain, Portugal, Italy, and Germany. And talk about wh what I see, if you see it as well, that there's a clear distinction between Spain and Portugal versus sure. Italy and Germany there. Yeah, so I, mean, I, I did a discussion of Tom Gallagher's book, recent biography on, on Salazar, the you know, so-called dictator of Portugal, who's also a very successful authoritarian ruler, but like Franco, was it, it, not in the least fascist. And I'll come back to to what that is. But and obviously, when you're shading into Italy and then Nazi Germany, you you see you get into the kind of authoritarian right wing regime that can more justifiably be called uh, called fascism. Paul Gottfried has a whole book on fascism, which goes into these interesting details. And, and I actually haven't read it yet, but I need to I need to focus on it. But but fundamentally, a, a fascist state is an authoritarian state where the state shades towards totalitarianism. That is, as Mussolini said, what it was, nothing inside this, nothing outside the state, everything within the state uh, kind of approach. Whereas at the other extreme in Salazar's Portugal, you had a corporatist regime, basically cooperation between the corporate entities limited as to their size and the government in order to create a Catholic state that uh, a Catholic kind of social state. And that was very successful. In Franco's case, you had something that was a bit more aggressive, probably, I mean, Salazar did not have to fight anybody to come to power. He basically was an economist who came to power because people couldn't decide on anybody else and they had some civil unrest. <laughs> and they're like, how about this guy? And so he, and he just stuck around. But Franco, of course, had to fight an actual war against the communists who were funded by the Russians and by the Americans. And he had, ran a very successful war. But he, he, he wasn't, Franco wasn't fascist in the least in that, in that understanding of fascism. He was a Catholic authoritarian who was very interested in ensuring that communism did not get a foothold in his country so that millions of people would be killed as a result as they had been recently killed in, in, in Russia. I mean, this, this is a trivial and obvious thing that, uh, that he, any sensible person would say that is a sound 
goal. And Franco executed that goal uh, very well. Um, some people got killed as a result. Uh, many of them deserved to be killed. No doubt some people didn't deserve to be killed, but a tiny fraction of the amount of people uh, that the, the communists would have killed had, had they managed to defeat Franco in the Spanish Civil War. So I think Franco, and then Franco proceeded to, to preside over a uh, industrial expansion of Spain very successfully. Spain, I think, was the fastest growing economy in Europe for, for many years running in the 1950s, and uh, which may ultimately have contributed to its uh, later destruction. They, you know, wealth does undermine a people's virtue, but that, that's a different <laughs> topic for a different day, perhaps. But it, Fr Franco is a fascinating character in his own, own right. He took over, for example, he, he took over the Spanish fascist party by... Uh, as it happened, the leader of the Spanish fascist party, Jose Prima de Rivera, had been executed by the communists. So he, the, the party was essentially leaderless. And so he announced that he was now having a party of national unity, which included the fascist party. And party of national unity means everyone shut up and do what I say. And you know, I'll, I'll, I'll say a few things that are nice about the fascists. I'll say a few things that are nice about the Carlists, as the monarchists, but I'm in charge and we're gonna run this country in a, in a coherent way that prevents it from being taken over by communism. Those things are much kind of, um, you know, for lack of a better term, uh, sinful approach to governance of Mussolini and particularly the Germans, where you run around you know, with your racial theories, killing people. And, I mean, that's a completely different thing. And so the purpose of calling Franco a fascist is to lump those two things together. But the fact is that the fact is that Franco was awesome and Hitler was terrible. <laughs> I mean, those two things are distinct. Amen. Right, I mean, no. So, it, but you're not allowed to say that. People are like, "Well, you, you, when you say Franco is awesome, the response is you love Hitler." I mean, it's just a dumb, low IQ way to have a political discussion. But that, it's true. It, Franco it, is awesome. It's super Hitler. low, and the best argument they have, which is still not a good argument, is this question. I think you wrote about it too. If I'm not mixing from something else that I've read about him, is this neutrality that he took in World War II, and and, and you know, you you mentioned the the kind of traditionalist alliance that he had with Catholicism, which almost uh, makes me think that he's more like someone you've written extensively about as well, Ernst Jünger in Germany. People don't, all, people often get the left critique of the Nazis, but they don't realize that this whole national socialist thing, it's weird to just call them socialists because they're not a part of the inter, really the international community, but clearly he's a different thing than the Ernst Jüngers and even the the people that were in the judiciary in Germany at the time that, that were more traditional, that allied with them. But you see from the swastika and other things, something that is even arising on the right today, this kind of neo-paganism and this the Indo-European yeah, stuff, absolutely. connecting it with Hinduism in India versus... Uh, the traditional Catholicism route. Those, those are different things. But there's also, like you said, the racial theories lead to kind of the expansionism, uh, whether it's from the Lebens realm or or, or the, the colonizing of Ethiopia and Eritrea or the successful colonization of Eritrea, failure to do so in Ethiopia of, of the Italians, whereas the Spanish and the Portuguese kind of uh, stayed put, even though they had empires um, yeah, in, the pa in the past had a pretty significant even at that point they, they had an empire but i mean franco was stabbed in the back by the catholic hierarchy in the 60s and 70s because you got these new basically philo communist priests and hierarchs who then proceeded to even though he had saved the church for saved the church in spain i mean all those people would have been executed or exiled by the communists they proceeded to stab him in the back and uh and that was part of the reason that his 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 reforms ended so quickly after his death. So it, it's an unfortunate fact of history, but you know, that's the way it goes. Yeah. And you mentioned the war earlier. Can you, can you say a little bit about that? And then I, I want to talk about like comparisons with America, but just cause I think a lot of people don't know that too. A lot of people mention um, George Orwell wrote about this and he actually fought on the the side of the of the left in that regard i forget i'm sorry the the specific terms but maybe the republicans i think the republican army i first learned about this from the film in spanish class uh pan's labyrinth and it, it was funny because even back then um i had mixed feelings but they clearly make like the francoists the bad guys in that film i've never seen that movie for that reason I mean, it's clearly communist propaganda from the descriptions of it so orwell actually fought for the anarchists palm which I, I don't know how to pronounce, it's, a, it's an acronym, and who were ultimately mo largely killed by the communists who were directed and funded by 
uh, the Bolsheviks, the Russians. And, and that's uh, Orwell's book, Homage to Catalonia, basically describes how his disillusionment as he realized that it was not some kind of uh, battle for freedom, rather it was the communists attempting to, to destroy freedom. That, that is Franco, I mean, uh, Orwell was not a, a fan of Franco but in any way, shape, or form, but he was also not a fa fan of the communists. And he, he realized that they, they, what it was that what he was doing was, in essence, helping a communist take over, which was not what he, he wanted to do. But, I mean, it, you can talk endlessly about the Spanish Civil War, and I agree there are, there are interesting parallels, which, which uh, I and other people have pointed out. But the, the, the Spanish Civil War is interesting because it's, the, it's, a, it's one of the few examples in modern uh, Western history of a ideological civil war that uh, that uh, originated from a slow boil and then originate and then erupted into open war. Begun uh, the violence was begun by the left, though the actual war was begun by the the right. The only other example, and something I frequently talk about, much more obscure, is the Finnish civil war of 1919, which is another one of these little civil wars. But normally in the West we don't think of ideological civil wars. That is, there are ideological civil wars, but they happen in places like Indonesia or Russia or you know, uh, other places. So it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting kind of um, object lesson because the Spanish of 1930s are not so different from you and me, from the Americans of uh, of the 2020s. They're you know, they're educated, they're Westerners, they're 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 not some people we can write off as just like prone to violence <laughs> or what have you, or whatever stereotype people like to apply to, to other cultures. So I think the it's it's informative to study the origins of the Spanish Civil War because it, it to a certain extent informs the possible arc of the American future. Yeah, the reason I ask you about that is because everyone uh, everyone says look to Rome. And Rome is the example of America. And they said the only question uh, is, is it the Roman Republic or is it the Roman Empire? But the the thing that shocked me is that the way in which you describe the ide ideological war that took place in Spain, it, to me, if something in history is an example, that it, that has got to be the closest thing to what America is on the brink of, God forbid. Yeah, I, I think that's true. And I think you see a lot of the exact same things. You see, for example left to use violence uh, every time they don't get their way and you see the the uh position of the left in spain as today that if the right wins any elections those elections are inherently illegitimate that is any any power gained by the right is inherently illegitimate uh and and ultimately if any power gained by the right that actually threatens to reverse or roll back any left gains is more than adequate reason to start a war uh, there can be, and, and, and people don't seem to understand that the left, both in America and in Spain in the 1930s, has long since abandoned the idea of you know, democracy or push and pull, or when you're in charge, you do what you do. You know, we're long past that. We're we're in kind of a, a proto, a pre-Spanish War kind of phase where the left is it, it, only willing to not kill, openly kill people on the right because they figure that uh, they don't need to yet, but they certainly will if the if they, for example, if Donald Trump wins again. And they see that as a potential rollback of their actual power. I mean, obviously, they're using political terror now. And uh, I ran the numbers the other day, extrapolating a little bit. We have more political prisoners in America now than East Germany did in 1989. Uh, they had about wow. 2,000, uh, roughly 2,000 political prisoners, including actual spies, though, uh, like spies for the West German governor, where government were counted as political prisoners. Um, but we have, you know, everybody who's in prison for their activities in the electoral justice protest is a uh, is a political prisoner. So we're at that stage where that's that's where we are and the the, uh, the inevitable arc of the left is to use violence if their power is in any way threatened. And it, the, ultimately the question is what would the response of the right be to that? And usually the answer is is not good. Yeah, but Franco was willing. He had the military acumen to gather and to unite these different forces, which um, it's it's reminding me too because there is, I think, a, a confusion even on the right and sometimes on the left about what you see in the tech sphere. And in the tech sphere, there's this idea that's almost worshipped of decentralization. And mm -hmm. I wonder if you could speak about that because that's part of what uh, some of the the secessionists or the balkanizers in Spain are wanting to do in Spain and 
Um, even some agents like Michael Malice in the United States have, have argued that there should be a divorce between red and blue states and, and that that would uh, lead to justice and harmony in, in America. But Franco seems to be a very centralizing uh, force. It's not like he even proposed a, a compromise of splitting the country then. No, and in fact, Franco uh, Franco was uh, accused, and it, it's hard to say because Franco didn't write anything down and he didn't say much. He, he said, uh, a, a man is a slave to his words, but a master of his silence. But Franco is, is often accused of prolonging the Spanish Civil War in order to kill more people on the left, in order to ensure that <laughs> Spain w would not have... Uh, would not have any tendency towards fragmentation after he won. I mean, and no one really knows what, what the truth is, but there, there's arguments for that. Uh, and so the I'm not up on Spanish politics, but I, I'm generally aware that there's various separatist, today in the modern era, there's various separatist movements within Spain. And Franco was very opposed to those kind of things. He wanted a unified Spain, strong, not not in the sense of having an empire like it's it's glory days but but unified spain and he resisted both attempts to fragment spain and attempts at foreign domination i mean famously he he refused largely to give hitler anything and stayed uh neutral in world war ii even though uh even though hitler had helped him out in in his battles and uh there's a famous story which i think is true i don't think it's and uh, hitler and uh franco met one time like hitler took a train to southern france or something to meet uh to meet franco and afterwards franco was not forthcoming on what hitler wanted and hitler said something like i would rather have three teeth removed than talk to that man again <laughs> <laughs> so he he was very focused on spain for the spaniards spain is and i think that's um the opposite of what some people as you say talk about today in a place like america that we have all these divisions and maybe the answer is national divorce. Uh, I will say that uh, it seems that national divorce might make a bit more sense in the American context, simply because the country is much bigger and has many more kind of both geographical and kind of cultural divisions within it, whereas Spain is more of a unity. But uh, as you were saying about Ethiopia earlier, the more granular you examine any nation, you can come up with any number of divisions, right? It's just the nature of it that people tend to divide into, into subunits. So maybe the the idea that Spain is is a unity is is somewhat of an illusion. Nonetheless, I think that you know, ideally, every country should maintain its its position as a nation, uh, if if at all possible, rather than just splitting up. Yeah, one of one of the early I was a Ron Paul fan very early on since 2007, 2008, and he pointed me towards these large economic tomes that the Mises Institute used to give. And the eponymous Ludwig von Mises always had this idea of he, he even said secession down to the household. Um, <laughs> but I, I generally love his his economics in the Austrian School of Economics and um, so there's part of me that likes that idea of national divorce, but practically speaking in the American situation, like let's say you gave the whole middle to the red states and you gave the coasts, you'd have a situation and we can get to it after like Israel and Palestine where you have the Gaza and the West Bank. And it's like, well, what about the airspace that would take? Like, do you need to travel all the way around the world or is, is there going to be any tension about flying over the so-called flyover states to get from DC to LA or from Seattle and San Francisco to New York and, and, uh, uh, Boston, but uh, you mentioned Hitler again, so I forgot this point. This is what I was going to say because I want to steal man. Sorry to bring up Hitler. <laughs> There's a rule for that, right, on the internet, Godwin's law. Um, but I, I wanted to address the. Um, I wanted to steal man the argument against our side, so that we can have the most powerful argument on our side. The one thing people mention that has actual some substance to it is that Franco did right send people to the eastern front and that was because of his um antipathy against the the, the soviets or the bolsheviks right yeah it was a volunteer regiment though that is i mean you know the it, it, it's entirely true that the you know, it, much of what drove the german and more broadly the european I, i'm half hungarian my grandfather fought against the russians it's it's drove it was an, it's an anti-bolshevik crusade and, and that's a righteous crusade the idea that people shouldn't volunteer to fight the russians just because they're fighting on the side of the germans is completely false the russians were more evil than than the germans and you know people should be praised for volunteering to fight the russians in the blue legion which was franco's volunteer force sent to russia so rather than saying well that's bad the answer should be that's good i mean because the the bolsheviks sucked i mean 
see I get I can say that on, on, on YouTube yeah yeah you're good you're good <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I try uh, so I I the, you, people try to this is a very common argument tactic against the right like you you did something that also benefited someone who's bad so therefore you're bad too the fact is you can have an alignment of interest with, with people who are bad and and, you know, that, and, and that doesn't mean that what you're doing is bad. What you do, what any of us does, has to be justified on on the individual basis of why that person did it, not because it happened to to benefit somebody else who of some third party who's also bad. Yeah, I don't know if many people caught it. There's a very common trend of this today because of the left bias of the history of the past couple hundred years. But I thought the Oppenheimer film, for those who could tell, did a very good job of demonstrating how kind of gung-ho he originally was about using the bomb against mm -hmm. the Germans. And then he was a little sadder and reluctant, but willing to use it on the Japanese and never regretted it. But when it came time to kind of plan for the Soviets, that's where he had so many, even if he was never a card-carrying member of the Communist Party, it was so much of his friend and family circle, including his that's own good. brother, that he just... He, you could you could see in the film i don't know how accurate this is but he, he almost like lost the will to do so there and began sabotaging yeah i think that's right and i think even this is a common american problem this kind of bizarre and false idea that well the communists weren't really so bad real communism hasn't been tried i mean you know th these things are all just false i mean you know stalin was worse than hitler that's the way it is but they're both very bad people so God, I'm not sure there's any any distinction in the, in the subtle distinctions are probably pointless. But in terms of like whether or not it's okay to fight against the Bolsheviks, it, the answer is clearly yes. Yeah. So so early. Yeah. And and just a final point on this, and then I, I do want to go to the Middle East, and we can we can wrap <laughs> up after that. Uh, but the um, uh, the policy in general is interesting because, for example, in World War II, a lot of Black Americans wanted to sign up and go fight on behalf of Ethiopia and several made it but the US government was prohibiting some of them from going as a state policy in general would you take it case by case or would you let citizens kind of volunteer to that's to a great struggle I mean, you you see this you see this a lot that how some people to go fight for other countries and then forbids it and basically treats people who do it as as terrorists i think that um you know i, I like off the cuff, I don't really know the the answer to that. I mean, it relates to the question of, for example, dual dual citizenship, and again, this yes. is in the Middle East, like whether you know, should the United States government allow people with dual citizenship to go fight, or for that matter, be drafted by the other country? Like, I generally disapprove of dual citizenship as a as a, I think you, know, you should be a citizen of, of one country only. Um, so in fairness, I'm also a citizen of Hungary. Uh, so, uh, but so I, I mean, I don't practice what I what I preach. But the, um, uh, I, I guess I'm kind of struggling because I don't really know the answer to that. That is, I think that um, you, you don't want to discourage it, but in practice, you don't want to discourage it because you, there's good reasons why people may want to do that, even if they're not dual citizens. They have connections. They they feel strongly about it. Maybe they're mercenaries and they want the money. But in practice, what you see historically, the Americans allow people to go fight for commies and punish people for doing anything else. Just like they allow people to okay. riot George Floyd. But if you walk around the Capitol, then you go to jail. So in practice, because of the deficiencies of the regime, it's used in a way that I don't like. So therefore, it shouldn't be used that way. So on a purely practical basis, I think it should be allowed, but only for causes that I agree with. <laughs> I, and that's fair. That's fair to say a case by like treat it case by case and whoever is in charge is going to because that's what it kind of is doing already. If I'm not mistaken, I think I saw that in the case of Ukraine. And for sure, for sure, I've seen it in the in the issue I want to discuss with you, the Israel Palestine. And, yeah. and it was interesting because some of the early numbers of American killed. Um, I think were not as forthcoming with how many of those Americans were actually IDF soldiers. Sure. And I think that would be a very interesting thing to find out of the statistics. Uh, well, right. and, and, and that's very misleading because you know, for these, their, their Americanness has nothing whatsoever to do with the fact that they're dead. I mean, it's just, and so to say they're American, somehow Americans are being killed. I mean, while technically true, it, it, it is extremely misleading.
And I think that you've seen that people are kind of discounting it for that reason. I mean, people discount everything because they know it's propaganda. And I mean, we can talk about whatever you want about, about the Middle East, but it's you know, it, one of the things we see is just the, every time you think the volume of propaganda and lies can't be ratcheted up anymore, you, you realize you were wrong. And in fact, there can be more propaganda and lies. So, I mean, that, and that's a big problem. Yeah, I think you had a, a great post that uh, gave me a chuckle. Um, I had proposed other things, but you had proposed kind of like a a Byzantine Levant. I had I had joked like, "What do you want the the Turks to come back?" Because you see Erdogan actually actively talking about punishing Israel for what they're doing to yeah. Palestine, or do you want the British to take over again, or their successors, us? Do you want America to take over the Levant directly, even though America doesn't do that really anywhere? And the closest yeah. examples, Afghanistan and Iraq, which are ho horrible. <laughs> Examples. Just, the no. best examples are the older ones like Philippines and Samoa and uh, Guantanamo Bay and things like that. But uh, different America. Yeah, I, I wonder what you what you thought about the rift, even even in that panel that you did with the new founding. I know at least one of those members, Dave, seems to be, um, um, you know, obviously like more allegiance to Israel and and fighting different people on the right about it. And then I seen the bigger rift, I think, on the left. Um, and just, I think the fights on the right are more about like active support versus nonchalance. Yeah. Um, and then on the left, it's like a it's a huge, huge divide, which is which has fascinated me and and maybe is uh, red pilling some of uh, the Jewish supporters of the state of Israel yeah. that were previously on the left and maybe are moving more to the center or maybe even right of center. Well, I've uh, yeah, I've been using the mute button with wild abandon on Twitter. Uh, and you know, uh, Dave Reboy is a friend of mine. And I, I love Dave, but I had to put a temporary mute on him because I'm like, dude, I just can't see all that. I mean, just like, and I, I put it like Kurt Schlichter, who's an author, I had to put a mute on him. And so, I mean, you know, because I'm like, we got to talk about something else and you're, 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 you need to like not, not be so emotional about it. Though I understand why people get emotional about it because I have, like, I have a huge number of Jewish friends who are very emotional about it because they have family there and, and what have you. And I understand that, but I don't need it on my Twitter feed all the time, I guess is my point, because I, I understand to some extent the, the strategic and political implications, but I, I don't need to be. It, it's like I don't. I try to not to watch whether it's Ukraine or this. A lot of war videos. I, you know, I think those things corrupt and corrupt and harden the soul. And you can make the counter argument that people need to know about this stuff, but watching war videos, I think, is is, is a mistake. In any case, that I'm, I'm getting off topic. The um, uh, the splits on the right, uh, I think, are interesting. Uh, the I think the, there's only one position that Americans should have on the war, which is what's good for the American people, not what's good for the Palestinians, not, not what's good for the Israelis, not what's good for the regime, not what's good for Raytheon, what's good for the American people. And so, and for, and uh, as a subset of that, what's good for Christians. So what's good for Christians is not to have the Muslims control the Holy Land. Because they, in practice, uh, modern Islam is an exclusionist, Wahhabist type of type of faith, and so that that would be very bad for for Christians. I mean, yes, there's some tension between the Jews and Christians and so on, but it's it's not it, the Jews aren't running around killing Christians, <laughs> and the Muslims are running around killing Christians all over the world. So that's just a fact of life, and it is true that I think the the new emperor of Byzantium should in fact command control the entire. <laughs> But the last I checked, that wasn't real likely. So I, I think in general, Christians Americans should favor continued uh, Jewish or is Israeli control of Israel. But it doesn't mean that we should fight a war over it. I don't think any American should die for that, nor do I think we should spend an enormous amount of money for that. If the Israelis can't take care of it themselves, then, you know, that's unfortunate, but you know uh, we're not we're not in the business of starting a, a yet another war with the entire Muslim world over that. I think uh, the splits on the left that you mentioned are particularly interesting. Um, and you particularly see this with Jewish people in America. That is, it appears that Jewish people who are the, uh, the left dominate in a whole variety, variety of areas, now they're seeing that those people are not repaying the favor. But I don't know if that's going to have any lasting effect or not i think probably a lot depends on what the ultimate resolution of this this war is and about that i have no opinion that i just don't, i don't understand what's going on i don't understand what the future holds everybody is lying everything is propaganda it's very depressing to me everything about this whole war like the ukraine russo ukraine war is depressing enough <laughs> i mean but this war is a whole other level of depressing uh, it's, i i it's very 
disheartening to me for lack of a, of a better term. Yeah, and, and I, I think the best interest for America is kind of, and I'm very biased to the non-interventionist, the old right school, um, uh, Buffett's father, the famous Buffett's uh, father, he was one of the old right. Um, I think President Taft has a cousin or something. He was a member of the old right. I'd written about it before. Obviously, George Washington's foreign policy and then the Federalist, although Washington didn't have a party of his own, the Federalist after him. And, you know, again, I, I get a lot of it from from Ron Paul. But and just let what happens there happen there. And, you know, the big fear from people is the influence of Russia and China increasing. And I'm like, look, man, we're in the we're in America, which is a part of the Americas. They are in Eurasia, which is a part of Eurasia. And mm -hmm. it's just like these are different, <laughs> different <laughs> sectors of the world. <laughs> yeah. But it, it's, <laughs> the British historian Tom Holland, I think on his The Rest is History, and, and I think I may have heard Dan Carlin also give these these cases when you're talking about Byzantium of the British being surprised in World War II, thinking about all the classics that they have read, and they're like, are these the same Greeks from the classics I've read? Not seeing any time, uh, not seeing that that moxie from them that, that they had expected from reading the classics, even supporting them uh, against the Axis powers at that time. But um, yeah, it's um, the control of Jerusalem is always um, an interesting question. But the rift in the left, I think the most fascinating aspect of it was um, it's brought up by Michael Millerman. And he he's obviously he's very uh, pro-Israel, um, but I, I think he approaches it from a philosophical perspective, which I appreciate. And he raised this question, which actually he wrote a paper on years ago, almost a decade ago, about in, in grad school, which is... Um, can can Israel be both Judaic and uh, in scare quotes democratic? And then he also raised some questions about you know the occupied territories and what Palestine is like, you know. And so one of the, you know in my jest, I said you know you could solve this by uh, getting the settlements out of the West Bank, letting the West Bank either be its own entity or smarter a part of Jordan. Mm -hmm. And then subsuming Gaza uh, within a Jewish monarchy, and I think like their number one, if they're prioritizing, we're talking about prioritization. Uh, you have to pick Judaism over democracy because if you if you choose democracy, yeah, that is clear. You'll lose the demography. Uh, uh, I, 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 that solution probably makes sense. I mean, I, I got in trouble on Twitter, not from the Twitter, but from other people for pointing out that no one remembers that. Western Poland used to be called Germany, you know, <laughs> I mean, and, and for that matter, you know, Eastern Poland used to, or Eastern, Western Ukraine used to be called Poland. Mm -hmm. And so, and may well be again, of, <laughs> of the That's Poles right. away. So, uh, you know, the, the, the way to solve these problems, whether we like it or not, is to move people to a new jurisdiction that is not, doesn't cause problems for the jurisdiction they're currently causing problems for. There's, and the only way to do that is, is, you know, non-democratically i mean it, in other words in an authoritarian uh ends directed fashion yeah i think that the tension on the left and i've seen this because i have several progressive friends but who are also jewish is that they have all these values in the american context but yeah. those values get thrown out the window in favor of a theocratic ethno state right. that has the illusion of democracy <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and well, it's I mean, like wait these are okay you get these weird bedfellows too. You know, you, you see all these people running around like you know LGBTQ people for Hamas. I'm like, Hamas. Yes. Oh, Hamas. that was hilarious. And I'm like, oh, okay. You Did you see the, there was a video? I don't know. You might have not gotten it from your mute filter, but there was a, a video of an actual confrontation between a couple of Muslim women and what sounded like a man. I don't know trans or whatever, but what sounded like a man arguing for the uh, alphabet soup perspective to two muslim women and they said no no but in our faith this is not allowed and i said this there it is what, what, what is there's a great communist phrase about is it the tensions or the contradictions finally emerging and, and heighten, smashing the contradictions. It heighten the contradictions yeah the the, the the contradictions were getting heightened in that situation yeah. and the large part of it is just ignorance i mean you, you've probably seen these videos where like young people in particular you ask them like just basic historical questions, very basic about any anything related to the conflict. And they have no idea, like none. They just have no idea who's who, what's what, nothing. Even stuff that's completely not disputed, not like a political football, just like the basic history. They just have no idea. Yes, uh, people like uh, the Jewish Lebanese uh, podcaster Gad Sad, and then the uh, Greek Orthodox one Nassim Taleb, also Lebanese, have mm -hmm. been 
pushing that what has happened in the past 10, 15 years is a demographic change in both Europe and in America where you see these large protests. But other people talk also about where is the source of the information that the the Zoomers and younger, I don't know what the one younger than Zoomer is, are getting it. And if it's primarily from TikTok, they say Israel's actually losing the information wars. And so I wonder what you think about uh, about what that kind of bodes for them. <laughs> I still think they would win. I still think they would win if, if push came to shove as they did before. But but it, it, it is fascinating that Israelis reputationally have suffered from this because if you're Mossad, your entire stock and trade is getting Arab dudes, girlfriends who are not their wives, and and using that to blackmail them to find out things that you need to know. I mean, that, and, and variations on that. I mean, human intelligence using the, the techniques that I you know are comfortable with, but. And then they completely missed this this whole Hamas thing. So the, you had, that's kind of a strike against their competency. And there's, there's a lot of criticism of their military work so far. I mean, I mean, we'll see. And the information war is even worse. That is, and I think that's not really so much the Israelis' fault. I think as a result of the other things the regime, our regime, has been doing over the past several years, people have realized that they're being lied to. So they then turned to other sources, which are also manipulable. The Israelis have no way to manipulate TikTok, right? The Chinese manipulate TikTok. <laughs> and, and, and young people are, are uninformed and stupid and have preference cascades. So it's not really surprising that, you know, Benjamin Netanyahu can't control TikTok. But it, 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 it's disconcerting that the, the that, I don't. I'm not on TikTok. I barely. I barely understand TikTok. But it, it, me you, too. <laughs> it, it's a very low information, emotive, stupid. You believe this because you your influencer. This influencer th says so in this 10 second clip. It's no way to run a society, and that comes back to uh, you know, really. We're seeing kind of that not just Judaism and democracy don't mix together. Having a well-run society and having and maximizing democracy in the sense of allowing every 18-year-old you know, who's on TikTok to actually have a vote isn't a good way to run a society. That doesn't mean you should take away the vote from everybody, but I think maybe 25 with at 25 and proof of being off TikTok for two weeks before the election is probably uh, probably a good place. To <laughs> yeah, I, I, my approach is everything is functional, so I believe even TikTok can be saved. If people saw my algorithm, I do have an account, but I don't you know know it and use it that much you you learn languages on there you get all these like yeah. language learning obscure languages and uh you get genetics information and then you get lee kuan yu clips that's that's my that's, algorithm that's a good feat but i mean that's not what most people get most <laughs> no. people get. I, 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 I mean you're right i mean i i, I i'm a big i'm a techno optimist and so on but the fact is we have to be the master of technology yes. and it's the exact, I mean, we don't have to go all Butlerian jihad kind of thing, but you know, you, you do have to master technology, but that requires not the government to take action, maybe some action, but it requires people to be virtuous and choose the languages and the Lee Kuan Yew clips rather than whatever the hell. So there you go. Oh, sorry. I, I, I lost you for a second. Can you repeat just that last part? Just that, like, it requires the people need to choose virtue. So it doesn't mean you should get rid of TikTok, that you should get rid of, rid of the Chinese influence on TikTok, but it means that people have to choose the Lee Kuan Yew clips and the, and learn new languages rather than the 99% garbage that's not currently on TikTok. Absolutely. Um, as we come to a close, and thank you so much again for your generous time, uh, Charles, I would love for you to give, just to make it somewhat standalone, although I do expect them to go watch your episode with me and everywhere else you've been, just punch his name into YouTube and Google and DuckDuckGo. But can you give an elevator pitch for foundationalism and talk about the worthy house, including everything you are, because it's always fantastic how many different uh, media you're on. Well, th thank you. So theworthyhouse.com is my website where I, I do my writings and also have pointers to stuff that I do elsewhere. So uh, it started off as doing book reviews and I still do a lot of book reviews, but they're really my own thoughts masquerading as book reviews. But I do talk about interesting books and what I think about them. So if you're into books, it's certainly a, certainly a place to go. And it's all free. I don't take prescriptions or anything. And the foundationalism is kind of a project that's developed out of that. It's what I call an applied political philosophy based in reality 
not an ideology. It's not an idea that you follow these 12 pillars of foundationalism, your society will be a utopia. <laughs> so as our as the age of ideology, particularly enlightenment, left-wing ideology comes to a close, these are the things, the pillars around which we can build a reality-based organic society that will lead to human flourishing rather than TikTok stupidity.